Reading 9 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Auspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nicole, Volume 3, Quarmid Ugle, November 24, 1945. Work on Attitudes. In this short paper, let us return once more to the idea of attitudes. The work teaches that we must observe our attitudes. You can call attitudes merely points of view that you always mechanically take. But this definition is merely introductory to the idea of attitudes. You can only observe attitudes to begin with by their results. An attitude is something formed through long, habitual, taking for granted thinking. The first thing is that we have to allow the truth of the idea that we have attitudes, typical points of view, typical ways of taking things, and that this, of course, belongs to our mechanical and therefore dead psychology. That is, that side of our psychology that cannot change. You can have an attitude to the weather, an attitude to religion or to science, an attitude to other people, an attitude to politics and so on. What people do not see is that their undiscovered attitudes create a great deal of misery for them and prevent them from understanding. No one of course admits that he or she has typical attitudes. Let me quote indirectly a recent observation that was sent to me. The observation was as follows. Quote, I had been trying to keep myself awake a little, more than once during the day, by observing myself uncritically. I noticed that it was just as if a bit of me was separated from the rest of me and was watching the rest of me. One side of myself was observing the other side, but observing it quite uncritically. This other side of myself, which I was observing, was taking an often recurring life situation in its own way. Quite suddenly, I had a sense of remembering the future. The result was that the whole situation changed. It was not only the future, but it seemed that I observed the past and the future together in regard to the same situation that I was faced by and that I saw my attitude to it and seemed to become free from it." End quote. Let me make some comments from the work point of view on this observation, which is a good one. There is a certain side of the work connected with the idea of karma yoga. This has nothing to do with acting or playing a role in life consciously, which probably none of us can do for a brief time, except for a brief time as we are at present. Karma yoga has to do with work on the actual situation that we are in karmically and finding the right way to behave towards it. It is quite impossible to practice karma yoga unless one has self-observation. That is, unless one can divide oneself into an observing side and an observed side. At every moment each of us is taking some event some situation in life in a mechanical, typical way, through attitude, chiefly. The practice of this aspect of the work connected with karma yoga has nothing to do with changing the situation itself, but with changing the way you take it. If anyone has practiced self-observation sincerely and really reached that stage in which he is not satisfied with himself and does not think that everything he says or does is always right, then it is possible to practice this side of the work connected with that particular form of yogi teaching called karma yoga. Now you must all understand that to be able to take this step means that you have really got somewhere in the work and are willing to work on yourself and no longer completely identify with yourself as you are. Which, as you know, is usually a very unsuccessful self. I will make only one or two points here. The first is, how many of you know or have realized that you can take 
a typical situation, a typical event, in a different way from what you have ordinarily done. The second point is, can you yet observe yourself uncritically? Everything recurs in your personal lives. The same situations arise, the same events, and the same mechanical psychology meets them and reacts in the same mechanical way, day by day and week by week. In all the attempts of esoteric teaching to try to make us awaken and become different from what life has made us, the practice of karma yoga is something that we can undertake intelligently and one which will give us immediate results. You will notice that in the above example, when this uncritical self-observation took place, there was a sense of the future and also a sense of the past. The typical attitude, the characteristic reaction towards the situation, became conscious, and at once there was a sense of the future. That is, that this thing has taken place over and over again. And suddenly there was a feeling of liberation from this hitherto unrecognized self-imprisonment, self-bondage, due to one's mechanical psychology, one's mechanical makeup. Here you have a very good example of what the work means practically on this side. But usually we are so immersed in sleep or so identified with every typical mechanical reaction, so much so that we always behave in exactly the same way towards ever recurring situations, continually lose force and remain in our state of deep sleep. Because you must remember that if you wish to awaken, you must find in what way you can save force and store it up. And no one can awaken unless he begins to accumulate force and to store it up. And it is often dull and dead moments which take force in everyone's life every day. These customary ways of taking daily things through customary attitudes towards them that cause a constant leakage of force. Now it is a very good thing to think as an exercise that you are taking today in an entirely new way. I say it is a good exercise in the morning to try to take everything that happens, all the usual discords and unpleasant tasks and so on in an entirely new way, if you can, for a short time. It gives you a glimpse of what work means and what transformation means. That is, transforming your ordinary daily life and taking it in a quite new way. In connection with this example, given above, I was asked, is this a question of self-remembering or self-observation? Whenever you have a double sense of the future and the past, meeting together in the present moment, it always has a quality of self-remembering. In this case, it was reached by uncritical self-observation, which lifted the consciousness to a higher level, that of self-remembering, or the third level of consciousness. Now, if you observe yourself critically, you never reach this level through self-observation. Why? because you will always be self-justifying, complaining, negative, and all the rest of it, which belong to the second level of consciousness, the so-called waking state. But if you can really observe yourself uncritically, you will pass from this complaining, unpleasant level to a quite new state of consciousness, and you will see yourself standing in time. Now suppose that you can be sufficiently awake to observe at a particular moment how you are taking some situation, some event, and suppose that you can observe yourself uncritically. That means that you can observe that part of yourself that is taking things in this mechanical, ever-recurring way. If the observing eye is really uncritical, it begins to move towards real eye, which is never critical. But if you are observing yourself with an eye that belongs to a lower level, a critical eye, then you will not reach the level of self-remembering. In other words, the quality of your observation is not fine enough, and you will simply be at that level at which you have to argue with other eyes. Your best eyes are uncritical eyes, eyes that never judge either you or other people. 
Your worst eyes are your fault finders, your jealous, envious, malicious, complaining eyes. Through them, how can you observe yourself uncritically? But through the pure feeling of the work, you can observe yourself uncritically as a mere nobody, not as a ridiculous and absurd creature, as of course we all are, without exception, because this would be critical, but simply as a nobody, as nothing. And I remind you here that unless we can realize our own nothingness, we can get nowhere. 